Well, I hope you, that you've enjoyed the various videos that were linked on the website. Um, I think that this video lecture will be a short video lecture because I'm hoping that the videos that you saw will leave a more lasting impression than anything I can possibly tell you right now. What we will do in this video lecture though is go through some of the definitions associated with learning uh, just to make sure you're okay with all of those. So learning is what happens whenever there's a behavior that's changed based on uh, the experience gained in, in, in an individual's lifetime. So there's many different types of learning. Remember that one of the big debates that used to occur was whether behavior was nature or nurture. And remember that scientists typically say now that for most behaviors, there's some combination of the two. Um, what I do want to show you, though, is two different types of learning. Um, one more rooted in genetics and the innate behavior realm than the other. So at the top, what you can see is the processes involved in a bird learning its song when it goes through the process of imprinting. And so remember, this is a type of learning, but it's when the behavior is acquired during a certain sensitive period. And remember that these behaviors are usually unchangeable and sort of in a rigid form. Um, after the sensitive period, you're not going to have a big discrepancy or ability for that individual to change its behavior. Example of learning how to make a song through imprinting, you can see at the top, you've got the sensitive period, the bird forms a template, and then a sub song, and then it has a crystallized, finalized song. And so that won't change after its sensitive period. Down at the bottom, however, you have an example of open-ended learning from another type of bird. And in this situation, there is no sensitive period. The bird is constantly adapting its sound based on its experience. So you can see that at the end of each breeding season, um, you have a song that's going to be changed for the next year. One type of learning that can occur is called habituation. This is when an animal basically becomes desensitized to, to some form of stimulus. You can imagine that if you were in a gigantic clouded, crowded room, you wouldn't want to be listening to all the different conversations happening around you. You'd want to focus on one person's. Uh, so what happens is you habituate yourself to the environment and you will block out the vast majority of crowd noise that's going around, on around you so that you're able to listen and focus to the person who's standing next to you. Why is this useful in the animal world? Well, let's use the example of the gopher here. If there were a certain animal like a cow that lived next to its little hole and every time the cow came by, the gopher scurried into its hole, it would be wasting a lot of energy and on top of that, it would be wasting potential foraging opportunities. So it's in the gopher's uh, best long-term interest to over time, if the cow is not a threat, to recognize it as something that's harmless and to basically avoid it. And so here we have the stimulus is basically being blocked out. And that's what habituation is. Spatial learning is a special type of learning based on geographical, um, basically, reminders. And so our example here is that of a wasp. What scientists did is they put a bunch of pine cones around the wasp's nest. And over time, the wasp, instead of flying to the nest, flies to the pine cones expecting to find the entrance to the nest in the center of those pine cones. What happens though, if we move the pine cones to a different location, the wasp is still trying to find its way by using those as a landmark. Uh, and so, quite a funny situation. It flies to the pine cones, expecting to find its entrance. It's not there. Associative learning is a type of learning when an individual associates one uh, component of their environment with another component of the environment. 
And so a good example of this down in the left hand corner, uh, you've got a kid who learns to associate um, soap with a bitter flavor. Okay. There's a couple of types of subsets of associative learning, something that's a little bit more uh, complex, where we've got the example of classical conditioning with Pavlov's dog. You have the scientist who rings the bell, and whenever he rings the bell, he gives the dog food. So after a long period of time, when you ring the bell, the dog starts salivating in anticipation of food, even if the scientist doesn't deliver the food. You've also got operant conditioning, which is another type of associative learning. In operant conditioning, through trial and error, um, we've got rewards and punishments. And so the animal learns what types of behaviors will be rewarded and what types of behaviors will be punished. And our example of that is the experiment of Skinner's box. And you can see a diagram of that over on the right. Cognition has a number of definitions, but basically it's the ability of an animal to have consciousness and awareness. It's the ability of an animal to process and use the information that's gathered by its sensory receptors. Problem solving, obvious type of learning, and scientists have been trying to study more of both cognition and problem solving inside of animals to see really what types of capabilities do they have. And pretty much every year um, we're finding that animals are capable of doing a lot of complex learning that we previously thought they were incapable of. So you've seen some videos of this. Here's what I want you to do for your homework. I want you to find two videos of amazing animal behaviors. Um, they should be awesome. I should be blown away by whatever it is that you find. And I want you to put links to those videos on the course website. So you know that there's a space on the bottom left hand corner for you to link your videos up. Um, tomorrow in class, we're going to look at some of the videos you found and hopefully be blown away.